Welcome to the nephrology section. The nephrology section is deceptively large because it's 50 pages. It's as long as uh, all of obstetrics. It's longer than the entire surgical section. And that's because the knowledge base for nephrology is relatively large. Now what I mean by deceptively large is that nephrology tends to work according to a lot of principles. For instance, the intro to this, the first five pages of the chapter, is looking at tests, diagnostic tests. And uh, so talking about hematuria goes across glomerulonephritis, goes across trauma and infection. And so you could say that the principles of nephrology make it in a certain sense easier than other sections because proteinuria goes across a number of diseases in the whole section of, of nephrology. Uh, now it's not so much that the number of questions is as many as say cardiology, but you still have to master the same knowledge base. It's not going to go away. Now we start out with the laboratory introduction to labs of diagnostic testing in nephrology because nephrology is really a laboratory cerebral specialty. There's very few physical findings. Physical findings is for cardiology. Cardiology is a physical finding section and you don't have that many tests. I mean, you can become a cardiologist tomorrow by saying, let's get an EKG and an echo on day one and get a stress test on day two, cardiac catheterization on day three. <laughs> the electrophysiology testing, that was eosinophils right there. And there's only five tests, same with pulmonary. There's only about five tests, chest x-ray, chest CT, pulmonary function tests, a blood gas, a lung biopsy. But nephrology is a laboratory specialty, so you start out with, well, if you don't know what to say, always say urinalysis first. Man, it's the nephrology section, I don't know what to do, but Fisher told me to answer the urinalysis first. And it's true because on the urinalysis, we're gonna say, okay, what about the protein on that urinalysis? Pro urinalysis shows protein. What about the white blood cells on that urinalysis? What about the red blood cells on that urinalysis? What about the red blood cell casts on that urinalysis? And as long as we're on the subject of casts, why not say, well, what are we going to do about eosinophil casts and hyaline casts and muddy brown and granular casts, muddy brown and granular casts? What will give us a person who's got telling hemoglobin versus red cells? What about tests like the intravenous pyelogram, cystoscopy? ultrasound and CT scan and of course kidney biopsy. Now you're going to look at all these and we're going to get a very distinct place to be able to put all of these in your brain. So the first thing with the urinalysis, uh, the first thing about that is <clears throat> that it tells you a protein level down to about three, what's the equivalent of 300 milligrams for 24 hours. Now that's what you need to have trace protein positive. In other words, you don't sense, you can actually have an abnormal protein level in the urine, but you don't pick it up on the urinalysis. In other words, the lower limit of detection of that test would be the equivalent of what comes out as 300 milligrams in 24 hours. Now, the other thing is Bench Jones proteins, Bench Jones proteins, such as in myeloma, don't actually show up. And that's the trick question. The person's got myeloma, they've got renal dysfunction, they've got dead kidneys, and it says that the person's only got trace positive on the urinalysis, and you're supposed to say, oh, urine immunoelectrophoresis. Urine immunoelectrophoresis, because you're supposed to know that the Bench Jones protein does not show up on the urinalysis. The urinalysis is only measuring albumin. The urinalysis only measures albumin. This is already a point right there. You'll see that around. It's an important question. So the urinalysis can show protein, white cells, red cells, hemoglobin, red cell casts. Does the urinalysis show hyaline casts? Yes, it does. Does it show muddy brown or granular casts? Yes, it does. Does the urinalysis show eosinophils? No. The urinalysis can't actually tell the nature of the white cell. The urinalysis itself can only tell that it's a neutrophil or poly. It can't tell that it's an eosinophil. How would you tell it was an eosinophil and you have to do a special blood stain or a blood stain, which is either a Hansel stain, as in Hansel and Gretel, 
or right stain, which are blood stains. How do you tell someone's got eosinophils for what disorder? Allergic or acute interstitial nephritis. How do I tell somebody's got allergic interstitial nephritis? Eosinophils inside that urine, eosinophils inside the blood, but eosinophils is more sensitive in the urine. So staying on protein and what is inside the urinalysis, if that protein is less than trace, 30 to 300 milligrams per 24 hours, that less than trace, but above 30, is still abnormal. Now this is strange, isn't it? In other words, the urinalysis doesn't show any protein, doesn't even show trace protein, but there's still protein in there. What is that? It's teeny weensy little abulon. <laughs> well, we don't want to call it like as we are mature professionals. We don't want to say teensy weensy. We don't want to say semi albumin, the margin of albumin. <laughs> We want to say microalbuminuria. Now, microalbuminuria, micro means it's there, but it's too small to be seen. It's too small to be seen in the urinalysis. Well, if it's so small you can't see it, then how are you supposed to go looking for it, huh, dude? Huh? What's supposed to tell you to go looking for it if it's too small to be seen? And the answer is you do it every year in a diabetic. And that is a critically important question. I guarantee you that that question in some version or another will show up. It's not cheating. They tell you, we're going to ask about microalbumin. That's not cheating. I'm not giving you the question exactly, but I'm telling you the topic. The topic, the topic is, is that all diabetics have to be tested for microalbumin once a year because you'll use an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker if in fact it's there. Now, if it's above trace and you secreted one plus protein continuously all day long for 24 hours, that would amount to being about one gram per 24 hours. If you made two plus protein all day long, continuously and even, that'd be about two grams for 24 hours. Now this is very unlikely because kidney function varies with two big things. One is the time of the day and the second one is posture. Posture. Which posture of the body, getting laid, I mean laying down or standing up, which posture of the body produces the most protein in the urine? Standing up. Standing up. And so when you're standing up and you have protein, mostly when you're standing up, that's called orthostatic proteinuria. And this is very important. You split the urine and you take the urine once at eight o'clock in the morning and you take it again at four o'clock in the afternoon. And you say, hey, how come you got the protein in your urine at four o'clock? But you didn't have that protein in your urine at 8 o'clock. What you've been doing with your protein, man, you've been hiding it. Hiding it in your shorts? Well, yeah, you have actually. And what's really important about splitting the level, splitting the urine, is that orthostatic proteinuria, which is that it's worse when you're standing up, is more benign. It's more benign. If you have persistent proteinuria, that's there in a urinalysis, you need to get a kidney biopsy. You may need to get a kidney biopsy because you may be having nephrotic syndrome. So you need 300 milligrams to have trace, less than 300 per milligrams of protein per day, but over 30 is microalbuminuria. You have to screen every diabetic every year for that. Protein levels in the urine vary based on posture of the day. They vary based on posture. They vary based on posture and time of day. They vary based on the posture and the time of the day. And that's why it is, if you had it continuously, that would be three grams. If you had four plus, it'd be, why does it only go up to four plus? Because once you know that you have nephrotic range proteinuria, three and a half grams per 24 hours, once you know you have nephrotic range proteinuria, 
It doesn't really matter whether it's 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 27, 527, 5,027. It doesn't matter how much it is because once you have nephrotic range proteinuria, it doesn't matter how nephrotic it is, how much more your nephrotic range. So the first test in, in nephrology is a urinalysis. You can have protein even without protein on a urinalysis. Ben shows proteins don't show up on a urinalysis. You have an elevated protein level and you want to know how much is there in 24 hours. So naturally, if you want to know about how much is there in 24 hours, what test do you get? <sighs> not the 24-hour urine. That is one of the most frequently incorrectly answered questions that there is because it's easy to mistake that you do not need to get a 24-hour urine to see on average how much protein there is in your urine in 24 hours. You do not need to know how much you do not need to know on a 24-hour urine to see how much protein there is in 24 hours. It turns out that if your protein to creatinine ratio is five to one, this means that you've had five grams of protein in 24 hours. If your protein creatinine ratio is seven to one, it means that you have made seven grams of protein in 24 hours. If it's 10 to one, it means you have 10 grams of protein for 24 hours. The protein to creatinine ratio eliminates the need for almost all 24-hour urines, at least as far as protein production. Now, this is so accurate, so true, so clear, so direct, that not only is it the answer for your test, but when you're on rounds, let's say you're studying for your exam, and you're finishing your third year, or you're in the beginning of your fourth year, you're finishing your third year, beginning of fourth year, if you can take this to the bank so much, that when you're attending is wrong. Or the OB resident says, let's get a 24 hour urine for protein. You can say, gee, I don't know, why do you need a 24 hour urine? I mean, can't you get the same information out of a spot protein creatinine ratio? And the resident goes, do what I tell you, because I'm the resident. You know, really. You want to order it on Monday, collect it on Tuesday, send it on Wednesday, spill it on Thursday, and finally get your result by Friday? Or do you want to, on a one-time test today, in 20 minutes, know what the result is? You can know this so well that you can disagree with authority, and I hope you do. Oppose authority. Doesn't make authority any weaker, makes it stronger. Orthostatic protein is benign. Protein creatinine ratio eliminates the 24-hour urine. Thank you very much. Now, white cells in the urine tell infection, and generally greater than five to 10 white cells in the urine tell infection. Remember, you can't tell it's an eosinophil without Hansel stain. Red blood cell casts tell you that you have glomerulonephritis. You don't know which form of glomerulonephritis is. You don't know whether it's anything as rare as Alport syndrome or as common as post streptococcal. You can't tell whether it's Wegener's granulomatosis, Schurg-Strauss syndrome, or lupus. You can't tell what form of the glomerulonephritis it is, but red blood cell casts can happen with any form of glomerulonephritis. Now, I didn't say nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome is different. Nephrotic syndrome is having massive production and loss of protein in your urine, but glomerulonephritis. Ooh, what is the difference between nephrotic and nephritic? Well, glomerulonephritis is characterized by the red cells and the red cell casts. Nephrotic syndrome is characterized by high 24-hour urine, low blood level of protein, because if you've got hyper protein in my urea, you get hypo protein in my emia. So nephrotic syndrome is characterized by much more protein and not red cells low blood protein, the blood level of protein. Now, the dipstick cannot tell the difference between red cells and hemoglobin. The dipstick cannot tell the difference between red cells, hemoglobin, and myoglobin. So the dipstick by itself cannot tell you if you have hematuria or myoglobinuria from rhabdomyolysis. 
The dipstick reacts to all three of them. Hemoglobin, myoglobin, red blood cells. Hemoglobin, myoglobin, red blood cells. Hemoglobin, myoglobin, red blood cells. The dipstick cannot tell. Hey! Can't distinguish between those three. How will you know? Very simple. Person comes in with a history of trauma, prolonged immobility, stat and use, run over by a cement truck, seizure, and the dipstick is positive for blood, but you look in on the microscopic and there's no cells seen. It is myoglobin. It's myoglobin. Hyaline casts is when people are dry. Hyaline casts are when people are dehydrated. Hyaline casts are an accretion of the normal TAM horse valve protein. Kidneys shed a certain amount of protein every day. And when that TAM horse valve protein, which is a normal amount of protein, gets accumulated because people are dehydrated, so the normal tiny amount of protein accumulates over time that's a hyaline cast it means dehydration it and you don't have to do anything because it's a hyaline cast you just have to know what it is Br muddy brown casts are also known as granular casts muddy brown or granular casts what's the mud what's the granules the blood the mud and the granules are the cadaverous dead body parts of acute tubular necrosis, they're dead tubular cells. That's acute tubular necrosis, dead tubular cells being sloughed off in the mortuary of your urine. Bacteria in the urinalysis, we don't care much about except for one person, maybe two. Bacteria in the urine, we only care about if you're pregnant or if you're gonna undergo a urologic procedure like cystoscopy. If you're going to undergo a urologic procedure like cystoscopy, we care because we don't want to increase the likelihood that you might put that bacteria into the blood with a cystoscopy. So if you're pregnant, we treat it. And if you're going to have a procedure, we treat it. Other than that, if you have a catheter, it does not matter. And I hope you don't walk around catheters because with exception, with the exception, of bladder obstruction, like benign prostatic hypertrophy or cancer, with the exception of bladder obstruction, Foley catheters are very bad. Wahish, wahish, bahad buddha, uchim bocha, tweet. Because bacteria gets up in there if you're instrumented like that, if you have plastic inside you. The intravenous pilogram is always wrong. The intravenous pilogram, if you've never heard of it, don't start now. If you have heard of it, this is just for me to tell you, it's never the right answer. It's an ancient test. It's largely discontinued. Cystoscopy is ultimately the test for the bladder. What happens if you have hematuria? You have hematuria. And in the hematuria, you've excluded the stones. It's not stones. You've checked the platelet count and the platelet count is normal. There's not a hematological disorder. There's not a hematologic disorder. The PTPTT is normal. There's no stones. There's no infection. There's no white cells. I've excluded that. There's no history of trauma. There's no history of trauma. And there's no stones. There's no hematologic disorders, no bleeding disorders. There's no infection. There's no trauma. Now's the time for cystoscopy. Now's the time to go up, periscope! Dive, dive, dive! Now's the time to go after cystoscopy because you want to say, why do you have that hematuria? Does hematuria mean the kidney or it's from the bladder? Hematuria mean the kidney or the bladder? Either one. Red cell casts, the kidney or the bladder? Only the kidney. Only the kidney, only the glomerulus can make red cell casts. The bladder or the kidney can make hematuria. Now, when you have to start imaging, start with sonograms. Benign, easy, no contrast, no radiation exposure. The CT scan is the answer to what is the most accurate test for stones, what is the most accurate test 
for hydronephrosis. What is the most accurate test for cancer or masses inside the kidney? The CT scan. And for stones, it does not need contrast. For a stone, it does not, for a stone, it does not need contrast. So, as we're looking at all of these diagnostic tests, we've given you a definite place for each one of them in your brain. Bottom line, start with a urinalysis and a sonogram for all the patients, but first comes, first comes the urinalysis. And we have a clear place for every one of these tests in your brain. And now it's time for us to start the other diseases.